strong semblance of consensus. Uh, the big thing was a massive undertaking. Uh, many of us in this room were around uh, when it was born and uh, stuck with it through all phases. Uh, it has done uh, miraculously good things for the city. The Greenway, give it time, is going to be a spectacular addition to the city. But there was a larger vision, a vision of public uh, facilities, cultural amenities. Uh, which has failed to come to be. Uh, those of us involved in Concord Place many years ago, and Honey was one, and others in the room here, knew that to overcome the premiums of uh, air rights, building over highways, you needed a massive commercial project, and you still needed to subsidize the project. Uh, but for those two things, Copy Place never would have happened. So the new center and the why, and I'm afraid the first thing I did when I came to the museum was look at these premiums and $56 million was what it would take to provide us with a platform to begin to build a museum. So we were designated. There was hope for a Boston History Museum, uh, but that was dashed by plain physical realities. So we quickly spied Parcel 9, and Parcel 9 is a, it's going to be the best uh, museum location, according to our consultants, in the country. So with that, I'm going to ask board member, old friend, Tony Lee, perhaps uh, the grandfather of uh, planning guidelines uh, to say a, a little bit about the process we went through in meeting your guidelines. Thank Thanks, Frank. Um, as a board member of the Boston Museum, I'm really very excited about having finally a, uh, a museum that deals with both past, present, and the future of Boston. And the location is just superb. It's, um, it's a very, uh, the site is within a very complex historical uh, uh, and layers and layers of Boston history surround the site. So the guidelines, I think, did a terrific job of trying to put all this together. On the one hand, we have the remaining 17th century blo uh, city block in the city. We have, obviously, Quincy Market, the, the Freedom Trail that goes uh, through over here. And so, uh, and the um, Old North Church, the North End, and the Greenway. So um, I think that as a board, we work very closely with the architect to try to make these guidelines uh, come to reality. And we don't see them as obstacles or um, uh, hoops to jump, to, to jump through in order to get a project. We embrace them. We see them as making the project much more positive. And with that, I think I'll turn over to Chuck to talk about the, um, the project itself and how we deal with those guidelines. Thanks, Tony. I'm Chuck Redman from Cambridge 7 Associates. We've been pleased to work with the museum, Boston Museum, for almost four or five years, getting to the stage, which is a very exciting time. This is an image looking from Quincy Market toward the North End, and it encapsulates the Haymarket District here. And it shows how we've tried to be responsive to the character of the hay market using brick and materials that are sympathetic to it, but also at the same time using windows that are a little bit different scale to present this as a, a civic project. Uh, you will get glimpses of what's going on inside and so on. If you look at the ground plan, basically we've taken to heart the idea of preserving a generous space for the hay market vendors here, in here and opened up the entire ground floor of the museum for haymarket use during the times that they want to do it or for other market uh, types of uses. We envision the ground floor open. You can come down Hanover Street on the Freedom Trail, wander into the market, come through the building, go to the park, or go into the museum, which has its main entrance here. We envision a small shop and a store, a small cafe that has indoor and outdoor activities, the other thing that we've taken very, very seriously is the notion of providing for 
garbage pickup, for garbage holding, wet and dry, uh, for the ability. Uh, we're thinking that this building is going to be very much a state-of-the-art uh, marketplace, which provides the kind of support and infrastructure that will make it clean and presentable all the time, and will support the needs of the Haymarket vendors uh, to continue their activities and work. This, this uh, model sketch shows how we've taken to heart the guidelines of keeping the Hanover Street end of the building at one story to allow a view from the north end into uh, Blackstone Block. It steps up several levels. It has a small pavilion at the top in which would be the Where's Boston Now show that we're going to bring back to the table as part of that. But it shows a very, very interesting possibility. If you were to be at night on the greenway looking at it, it's, it acts as a lantern, as a transparent window into what's going on inside, but also an important window that engages and presents itself to the city at large. This is a section through the property in an elevation. It steps from 18 feet at the lowest level to 50 feet in the mid-ground, 60, and the small portion at the top is really at 82 feet. And this is something that we felt was an important way of, of, of confronting and dealing with the guidelines that encourage this kind of stepping up of the building, but also retaining its one-story presence uh, at this critical end where the Freedom Trail comes through and where you really get a window across the Greenway into the uh, Haymarket itself. The last sort of series of drawings I'll talk about take the ground floor and stack the museum on top of it. The idea is that people would enter the museum, come up to the top, be introduced to the city through where is Boston now, and then essentially circulate back through to the various exhibits. We've also provided inside an education center and meeting space for the community at large. Uh, there would be traveling exhibit spaces, which is really an open-ended way of saying that any kind of idea from a neighborhood group or constituency of the city that wanted to present itself here could do that. And at the ground floor, again, it is basically wide open <coughs> and open uh, for business uh, for both the museum and the market and the use of the city. Frank, do you want to pick up here? Actually, if you would, go back to that last slide. Uh, again, mm -hmm. no, that's right. The top floor, Where's Boston now? Cambridge 7 did the original Where's Boston. Uh, they would update that, make it dramatic, uh, shorter, uh, punchier. And at the end of that program... Technology has changed a lot. We could do that easily on exactly. my iPhone. At the, <laughs> at the end of, uh, at the, end of uh, the show, the screens go down, and you have this vista of the entire city. A great venue for corporate meetings, for marriages, all sorts of uh, things. A must-see exhibit in the city of Boston. And then you go down to growth. Growth is real estate development. It's topographical evolution. Boston has done that more than any other city in America, and so many brilliant things started in, in Boston. The anti-highway movement, historic preservation, uh, uh, the uh, anti-urban renewal uh, initiatives that so many of you in this room have been involved in. Uh, they all got started here. Those stories ought to be told. They shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, people, that's immigration. Uh, we know a lot about uh, Boston's immigration history, not enough. So many other waves of immigration continue to visit Boston and contribute to the rich diversity of the city. Those stories ought to be updated and, uh, and, and relished in. Politics, that's uh, my word for the morality plays that are always open in Boston and then go nationwide. <laughs> from, the, from the labor movement to women's rights to gay rights, you name it, they start in Boston and sometimes reluctantly, sometimes not so uh, 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 reluctantly, spread nationally. And uh, those are important stories. And the, we have our own peculiar politics. Those stories should not be forgotten. Innovation. We're the heart of innovation. And the mayor talks about this. MIT has an innovation museum. They wanted to do programming here. Uh, one of the principal characteristics of this museum is a partnership and, uh, institution. We want others to come in and share our spaces and do programming in the heart of Boston. We have a partnership with the New England Sports Museum that wants to do programming in our building and uh, so many opportunities for education. The push card vendors, we embrace them. They can have the time around for, if they want to be open more than two days a week, they want to be open seven days a week, they can. <coughs> but we will have the rights to backfill to, uh, with <coughs> other uh, uh, kind of vendors from other parts of the state 
on days that they don't want to be in this ground floor space. Again, uh, inside Friday, Saturdays, but any day of the week they want to be there. Uh, these are the themes that I just went through. We've done a program book. Many of you seen, have seen that program book. Uh, it describes some of the uh, ways in which we will have dynamic, interactive exhibits. Kids can participate in the storytelling uh, through the technology we have today that we didn't 30 years ago. Education programs. <clears throat> the Boston Museum has already been actively engaged with teacher training, uh, summer institutes. Uh, we have partnerships with Facing History and Ourselves, Mass 2020, <clears throat> the Amana uh, Academy. Uh, we had a great nifty program where over at the Amana we had the kids over the summer basically study uh, blue line stops and look at the history of those blue line stops. And they came up with things I didn't know. Orient Heights was the site of the first uh, naval battle in American history, the Battle of Chelsea Creek. Uh, Maverick, uh, that station is named after the first slave owner in America. Interesting stuff. This is a public institution. It does education. It reaches out to the entire broader Boston community from Portland to Pittsfield to Providence and brings them in. And it's a gateway. It's a gateway to these other parts of the state. Uh, the wonderful cultural in institutions that we, uh, we enjoy today, uh, the original MFA in Copley Square, land was donated. Then that land was uh, sold and the new F F MFA went out to the Fenway. Uh, the Museum of Science started on Boylston and I think it's Clarendon, or maybe Burton. Uh, and today it's uh, benefiting from a one dollar a year, 99 year lease from the MDC, the former MDC. The ICA uh, got basically free land as part of uh, the Fan Peter development. <coughs> and the aquarium got a heavily subsidized piece of land uh, as part of urban renewal. If you use the land for the highest and best use, you'd have two more towers. We're not asking for any subsidies. We'll pay fair market value. But to have a rich, diverse, dynamic, cultural base, people have to cooperate, people have to see a larger vision. We know we can be successful here. Uh, we basically, uh, we know it because all around us, significant amounts of money have been given to PB Essex, the MFA, Museum of Science, Gardner, Institute of Contemporary Art, Children's Museum, New England Aquarium. In a bad economic downturn, things are getting better. We, we see that all across the country. We're competing with, with cities that are expanding their historic resources, understanding that you really can make the mistakes of the past if you don't know history, Santayana. There are positive benefits from having great historic resources too. You can basically uh, take the good of the past and project it forward and build upon it and compound its benefits. Uh, five permanent exhibits, changing exhibits, uh, free education programs. All City of Boston uh, students come to this museum for nothing. We know we'll be uh, uh, successful because Consulticon says uh, we've done three feasibility studies <coughs> and they underscore the benefits and strength of this. If we build it, if we build it, they will come. Uh, 430,000 uh, visitors paying roughly $11 a ticket and uh, we will be a successful museum. As such, we're a, a very attractive legacy investment for the donor community. <coughs> We've got a great location, the best in the country. We've got our stories to tell. Uh, for me, it's a hard thing thinking fish, aquarium, science, and the science museum. They're tremendously successful resources in Boston. We've got our stories to tell. That rich diversity of all of these uh, great uh, uh, aspects of local turf. And that creates local pride and a desire to invest and stay and commit to the greater Boston area. We have a board that is strong. Linda Whitlock is leading the charge. She raised $109 million for the Boys and Girls Clubs. She's joined by Churchill Franklin, who is chair of the board of trustees at Middlebury College. He raised $400 million there. We've got uh, Penny Grayson, 
Uh, we've got Jane Patterson. We have uh, strong, active, dynamic board members that once we have the designation and we've got something to build upon, we will attract even stronger, uh, co even more committed uh, donors to our board. So we can do this. We're surrounded by successful enterprises that have done it. So thank you very much. Frank, uh, let me turn it over. I think you make a very good case for a Boston Museum. That case has been made well before, which is why you got the designation of the Cross of 12. I'm a little less persuaded that you've made the case for the Boston Museum on this site. And it has to do with the history that you refer to, going back 20 years mm -hmm. when you and I were both involved in it. Since the very earliest time, Parcel 9, in the Boston 2000 plan, was designated for commercial development. It's zoned for retail and residential development. There were six parcels that were designated for civic and cultural development, including Parcel 12. None of them, as you know, have come to fruition for a variety of reasons. But I'm wondering why the Boston Museum belongs on Parcel 9 to displace what was long intended to be a commercial development use, when arguably there are available parcels for precisely the use that you're proposing that don't involve ramp construction. And I'm thinking specifically, for example, of the Mass Horticultural Society parcels. Why do you belong here rather than there? <coughs> and why do you belong here rather than the commercial development that has long been planned? Uh, well, just the opposite is the case, too, that uh, commercial development, you know, can go someplace else. Lots of other, other places for commercial development. This is a very special, historic part of our city. It's 50 feet from the Boston Stone. The hay Haymarket pushcart vendors uh, be become a, a living exhibit in a museum. Uh, this, this whole area is rife with history. It's ground zero in our city in terms of tourism and uh, 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 pedestrians, uh, the, it, the imageability of this site for a museum is fabulous. It's the first building you will see when you come up from the subsurface uh, artery. And that, that's, what you, that's the statement you want to make. Uh, this is not just another commercial development. It's not uh, it basically a private development. And by the way, the FAR it limits it to 120,000 square feet. That's not a lot of uh, private development. We're, significant private development is proposed all around here. We only need 109,000 square feet to create a really vital educational and cultural institution. And that's the location. Uh, people can throw out ideas all the time. And you know, just because something was planned 20 years ago, yeah, I'm glad that, uh, remember, what was it called? The Commonwealth Center, it's gonna be two big office buildings down in the combat zone. I'm glad that died. Uh, Tony Pangauer's done a great job bringing residents there and retail activity there. So lots of projects that died because it was part of the plan 20 or 30 years ago, sometimes it's a good thing. And if commercial uh, development dies on Apostle 9 in favor of a public use on a public piece of land on the Greenway in the middle of uh, the place that, that attracts everyone on the way to Paul Revere, Old North Church, uh, North Station to go to Salem or Lowell, uh, that's where it belongs. And I'm getting too old to think about other sites. <laughs> Before I go to honor, I just want to acknowledge that Maria Popolo from Rep, um, Mike Witz's office is here. And I know that uh, Stephen Pascantilli from City Councilor uh, Martinez's office is here, but he had to run to another thing and we'll try to come back, but he, um, he was here for the first part of it. I just want to acknowledge. I, I think it's the Bruins here. <laughs> would very well be. Otto? Frank, I'd like to compliment you on the proposal, but. Uh, Right away, we have a problem here with the fire lane. Do you have a solution to this fire lane? Because as it as is, we lose our third row of functioning. I mean, it just doesn't work. Uh, you, you know, Otto, I, I thinking about this. Uh, you know, the two options you guys put out there: option one, one, option two. We did option two, which pulls the maximum number of haymarket vendors inside the building, which should maximize the potential of Blackstone Street to be preserved as a fire lane. So. Of all the proposals, I think we have served the interest of having a file lane uh, as, as much as we can. 
if we can do a better job <coughs> auto and reconfiguring and doing this that, and the other thing, we'll do it. But, I mean, how, how can you push all of you guys out of our building <coughs> or out of parcel 9 and still preserve a file name? With that said, that, you know, that third row of uh, stands, that's people's livelihoods. Yeah. And now you're talking about putting them inside the building. Do you have a, a, an amount of money that's per square foot that these vendors would have to spend to go into the building? Uh, co the covering their operating costs is all that we're looking for. Uh, auto, a museum, typically on the ground floor, is called a free zone. You don't expect to make money from it. Uh, think of any museum you go into. It's just a big convening area. Uh, there's a museum shop and a cafe, which we have. But it's a free zone. So we're basically offering that space at operating costs. That's it. Cover operating costs, you have, you're home free. Okay. And, and, and you guys complement the whole purpose of a historic museum. You are history. You are the people of the city. You, you represent all those things that we're trying to do in the upper forms. Thank you. Victor? <coughs> um, you know, I'm from the North End, uh, coming with concerns from the North End. Um, and one of them has to do with the program. Uh, and how can you give us some comfort to convince us that this will not be a stop from Faneuil Hall Marketplace where people are visiting uh, and buying uh, and, uh, and coming to this site um, for t-shirts and other sports memorabilia. And if I can jump to the sports aspect of it, <coughs> as, I, as I look at this, I wonder, isn't a sports museum more appropriate on Causeway Street than on the Greenway? And then I come back to program, and will you have permanent collections? Will you have rotating exhibits? Um, can you answer some of those yeah. questions? Show us what we can expect to see, I, feel, yeah. and what kind of traffic um, we will expect uh, to experience in the North End. Yeah, well, I think you're asking about three or four different questions. But uh, um, well, one question is easily answered. We have a program book. I believe each, each of you have received a copy of that program book. Today, yes. And, uh, no, not today. Uh, it's months ago. But, and if you need more copies, John, you can get more copies. But basically, each of the main exhibits will have uh, a permanent little entry hall, and that'll be a permanent exhibit. Uh, but it, again, it's still going to be interactive and technologically oriented. We're not going to collect things. We're not going to be a collecting museum. But the main exhibit spaces will be changing exhibits. Um, uh, the, the curators will be constantly working with uh, the New England Genealogical Society, the Innovation Museum, uh, uh, the Bostonian Society, others reaching out to Sports Museum to do compelling new exhibits on an ongoing basis, giving people a reason to come back time and time again, giving Boston school kids a reason to come back time and time again. Now, there, I have heard a concern expressed that, gee, they might go there and not come to us. Um, two things. We're, we're basically going to be a diff very different product from the real thing. I mean, you've got the Paul Revere House, you've got the Old North Church, you've got the Old South Meeting House. I mean, you've got the real thing, and people come to Boston for those things. But we're offering uh, to be much more a visitor center, a gateway center, and to do different, tell different stories. Stories since uh, the Revolutionary War. And, uh, and Economics 101, the more you add attractions, the more people come. Uh, I remember the concern when Copy Place was going on, uh, Newberry Street, you'd have a negative impact on Newberry Street, the opposite happens. Uh, Park Square has a restaurant, let's not let in another restaurant, no, just the opposite. Two, three, four, five, six restaurants, they all do better. Uh, the pie expands, it doesn't shrink. We've done economic analyses of that, we've shared them with you. Um, I don't know what more to do, but Boston grows, uh, it creates more jobs when people embrace good, sound, solid economic growth. And we think, you know, in creating 1,200 jobs, contributing $86 million to the regional economy, that's what this is all about. Any 
Anybody else on the committee before? Uh, well, before I take you again, anybody else? Brian? Um, I'm just uh, a little concerned. If you can go back to the slide of um, the building lit up at night. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned it would be a, a lantern. Uh, to me, that looks more like a spotlight. And I know the park, you know, at night is a, is a nice place for people to go. And my only concern is being a resident from the North End, you know, going on your roof deck at night, used to seeing, you know, a nice peaceful Boston skyline, and then seeing that. Um, and this might be too specific of a question to ask, but is that, are those lights going to be on 24-7, or is that something that shuts off at 8 o'clock at night? Yeah, obviously, uh, <clears throat> museums close down, and obviously, we're looking at the bottom line. I wouldn't expect this to be on all the time. So, but it, with the community, it may well be that you'd want some lights on, on some features. But, you know, this is very much an Article 80 kind of review topic and to be worked out. But will the lights be on all through the building all the time? No. Okay. Thank you. Ground floor lights are probably on much more than the upper lights. Again? Yeah, Frank, um, you said that once you got designation, it was successful that you start the fundraising campaign. How long do you envision it would take to, to raise the type of money uh, to build this structure? <coughs> how long to construct it, and when would we actually see something? Yeah, uh, well, it's going to take, uh, Peter Gorey uh, would fast track it, but it's at least going to take a year <laughs> to get through uh, the out of lady process. It's going to take, uh, probably 18 months to design. Uh, we'll raise the money, we'll start construction in, in three years. We'll probably start construction with about 70, 75% of the funds raised, just as the M MFA did, and get a bridge loan from mass development and complete the fundraising by the time we complete the building. So I, I think it's a five year project. And uh, again, Lin if Linda were here, she can't be here tonight. She's, she makes a very compelling case. She's done this before. She knows the Boston Donut community. We've had very successful discussions with the usual suspects. And as Linda says, she knows who they are. And uh, so we are confident that if we control the site, if we had something to sell, uh, that the power of this site and the compelling nature of the ideas and the uses, uh, we will raise the money. This is a great legacy opportunity to put your name on a gallery in this building, uh, in this location, is a very compelling donor ask. Claudio? Yes. My, my question uh, are two questions. One is, what do you envision selling in the, in the shop, in the museum shop? Right, yeah, just for people, Claudio came in late. Claudio is from the Fannie Hall Merchants Association, and he's a member of the committee as well. He came in after we did introduction. Sorry. Uh, not trinkets. No, yeah, it, it's, it'll be books. It'll be oriented to history. Maybe DVDs on the history. Maybe a lot of the technological stuff would be sold. But we haven't gotten there. But, um, you know, I mean, stuff that resonates with the stories we're telling in the building. The, the other point that I wanted to make, and I can speak <coughs> from a point of view of Final Hall and a point of view, not necessarily of all the merchants, but certainly of what we tend to hear a lot from our visitors and our customers. <coughs> and I've been there for, since 82, so I've been there 30 years this year. And one thing that I hear continuously both from tourists and from local residents, is that Final Hall used to be a place where Bostonians used to go to, where there were a lot of shops that were varied and mixed, and that it has, over the years, become increasingly, quote unquote, a tourist trap. That, that it's really an area that has been catering more and more and more to tourists, when the original intention was to serve the Boston and the greater Boston population. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I see the museum as, in fact, bring, we, we, we have lots of tourists there, and especially in the month of July, August, and September. 
And what I'm concerned is, is that the rest of the year, which is where the businesses are weak, weaker over there, that the museum is in fact going to bring more crowd at, at the peak time. <coughs> and much of the traffic generated, I think, it would be traffic that will be there on the Freedom Trail anyway, and looking at Boston as a real museum, as a living museum, right by walking through the streets down in that area. I, I, we, we, so that's, that's my concern, yeah, that we, it, which we will just increase the amount of tourism and push out even more the Boston residents. Uh, well, actually, if you read our economic studies, I, I was even shocked <coughs> to read this, but more than half of the visitors to the museum will all come from the greater Boston area. And with the changing exhibits, they'll have reason upon reason to revisit <coughs> time and time again. So uh, it, it's contrary to your notion that it's just outside tourists. It, it, again, this is truly an educational, cultural institution, primarily for people from the greater Boston mind, if you will, um, that would, would be attracted to this kind of storytelling and uh, want to come back when the stories are changing. <coughs> uh, uh, Frank, I just want to follow up on, on Dan's funding question. Uh, you are nothing if not confident. You are also nothing if not candid about the challenge that you're involved with in the funding. And you've told this group in previous sessions that it might take you three years to ascertain whether you would be successful in that regard. I think you alluded to that as well here tonight. And that sounds perfectly reasonable. My question is, what if? I mean, we have had a history of lack of funding by all of the civic and cultural institutions, including Mass Hort, which had the development designation from the beginning. <coughs> if you are not successful, where are we in three years on Parcel 9? Uh, all I can say is, uh, have you been to a Mass Hort meeting? <laughs> um, okay. uh, Linda Whitlock is a different creature. She's done it before. This is a very compelling donor opportunity. It's got a great location. We will be simultaneously going through approvals and doing design. And when we have raised the necessary funds to start construction, within three years, we'll start construction. What can I say? All around us, people are raised. PBD Essex raised $300 million to build the expansion, Moshe Safdie. Um, they just raised another $500 million for endowment. And uh, Sam Byrne, a real estate guy from Boston Capital, <laughs> led that campaign. We will have access to that kind of uh, fundraising capacity if we get the site. It's an incredibly marketable, attractive opportunity. And if that happened in the last five years, uh, I expect things to be uh, easier in the future. I mean, uh, we have had extremely positive con conversations, numerous conversations, with people saying, we're in that. Get it under control and get it your approvals, but we're, we're there, we're funding this. What more can I say? <laughs> Any other uh, questions from the committee before we pick up? Well, <coughs> I uh, step in with trepidation uh, on the issue of aesthetics, but Ryan Kenny has opened the door a crack when he spoke of uh, uh, spotlight versus lantern. So uh, let me put my foot through that. The um, development guide, and perhaps this should be addressed to Appendix Seven. The uh, Parcel Nine development guidelines said, in reference to the North End Park facade, it should not be an object building focusing attention on itself, but instead it should create a frame or setting for and in concert with the Greenway itself. Uh, how did you deal with that guideline? I think we looked at the building, maybe we should talk about it, let's see if we can find it. We looked at the building as a transparent window into the activities and uses there, because we felt that was a very, very compelling way to engage the public. In many ways, it's a quiet building. It's not, I think, aggressive. It sits, it's a very simple curve. It matches and follows the line of the greenway. 
it leans a little bit toward it. And our thought was that it would be kind of a, a, a calm and passive voice, but it would be a transparent voice. Our object for designing many, many museums and, and many kind of uh, attractions is to figure out a strategy by which you can engage the public to interact with it. People can walk by, can look in different windows of it and see what's going on. People, they will see people inside participating in it. That was the idea behind that notion of making this a transparent window. So we think in, in, in many respects the, uh, the lighting is something that we'll manage and we'll deal with. Uh, we want people to understand and, and, and have a little bit of mystery about what's inside, but also to be able to see inside. This is also a great place <coughs> for the public who go here to look back across the Greenway, to look across the Greenway toward uh, the North End and up and down. It's a very, very pleasant place. It will, it will sort of take your Greenway walk and lift it up a little bit on that and let you do it again. Chuck, uh, if Tyler, you want to say? Well, I think it's a, um, the intent is not the building to be an object, but that it's a showcase for the exhibits and the museums and the galleries. And that's why it's transparent and having people active. So it's not a blank facade uh, or uh, a facade in which it is um, solid but doesn't have any activity on it. This is more a modest, lighted building. I don't think people have seen the Cambridge Public Library. I think has that kind of um, presence of seeing people yeah. and the books and, and the, and the uh, stacks. And I think this will have the same kind of uh, uh, appearance. And really, the opposite of an object building. Thank you. Any other members of the committee? Okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to the public. I'm going to kind of just start, go front to left to right, front to back. Raise your hand, please. Um, if you could uh, tell us who you are and where you're from, we'd appreciate that. So, anybody along the first row there? Um, as an educator in the North End, I teach at St. John, and I'm speaking Marjorie, for... Marjorie, can you tell us who you are? Yes, Marjorie Sartana. Um, I'm speaking for um, the North End, and students in the North End. What, can you explain further the <coughs> educational component of this? Uh, students are going to be about 23, or inside that year, like a program for them, on a regular basis, changing programs. Uh, basically, for the last three summers, except last summer, we had teacher institutes. We raised the money for all of uh, focused on the Umana School. Um, and we basically uh, had, during the summer, it was uh, a, a variety of activities. I've mentioned the one about having students, that was for kids, basically study the history of their subway stops. That's a way of getting to know neighborhood and city and they just discovered a lot of interesting things. We had, uh, most of the teachers in the city of Boston weren't he here when busing happened. And uh, I think the number 60%, 65%. So we had a curriculum two summers ago on what busing, what that all meant to the Boston public schools. And we had, uh, uh, we had Mel King, we had uh, Bill Bulger, we had a variety of folks talking. And, uh, I've got evaluations of the program. We have letters of endorsement. I'd be glad to share that with you. Uh, but you know, it would be great. We have a whole education center. Um, we've done programming without a building. Uh, we'd like to do partnerships with Facing History, Mass 2020. Um, but if we had a building in this location, it would be easier to really build upon that education program. Next row, anybody? Okay. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'm Scott Lampert from the Haymarket Pushcart Association. I noticed on your floor plan, it seems like you've just basically, you've got a museum and you've herded a bunch of uh, pushcart peddlers on the first floor, but I don't see any provisions for the other half of the association, for the stores. We provide a symbiotic relationship with the fruit and vegetables outside. There's a meat store. There's a cheese store, fish store. I, uh, my family's been running the oldest meat store, retail meat store in Boston for 101 years. I don't see any provisions for stores within that bottom floor. It looks like just one open space. 
Well, this is not a final plan, but we thought that was pretty much what the guidelines were talking about. Just kind of a, a place to set up and, and market wares, and uh, rather than break it up into individual stores, we thought that was the goal. Uh, I'm sure if the city ch changes its mind and wants to change the guidelines, we'll listen. We'll we'll talk with you. But basically, we're we're making all of that space available. <coughs> <coughs> but it can be provided for stores. The, the original tent or the thought was that the, the, store, the fruits and vegetables would be outside and the stores would be inside. I don't... Uh, you've pushed everything inside and eliminated the stores, it seems like. We haven't eliminated anything. Okay. We've added. This is all new. Yeah, I understand, but there, I don't see any provisions for stores there. It just looks like it's one wide open space. Tough to design a market uh, at this stage of the process. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that uh, is that the, um, uh, there's no barrier when it's open to the outside, so that the, uh, the overhead doors open up completely. Yeah, KB7 did the Children's Museum, and all around here are these glass garage doors that open up. Mm -hmm. So. You'll just be able to walk through. Yeah, it's all open air. I mean, but stores need like refrigeration units. They need ice makers or refrigerated chests. These are spots that need to be in a closed-in area. Yeah, I, 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 again, I can't anticipate what the okay. pushcart vendors want uh, at this stage of the game. But we, but you could work with it if you had. To. Well, we, we well, certainly we're providing it in, in the sort of gray zone, which is called service. Is uh, some general refrigeration and storage units, undesignated, because we're not sure really what would be needed and what would take place. Having a wide open floor allows you to plan it the way you want. So I think this is part of the, the dialogue that should take place as to really get very specific about what is needed. I don't think the guidelines said that there were stores, but I'm not sure. Yeah, Scott, there's nothing in the guidelines that prevents the stores from being there. Right. So it could be could be made to accommodate the stores as well. Easy. Yeah. We have wet and dry trash. Uh, we have three docks. I mean, we we fully comply with the guidelines as it relates to the push pad vendors. Again, we opted for option two. So. Thank you. I'm Jeanette Herman. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you've come back with a ground floor that's very different from what we saw last time. I, I think it, it shows real improvement. I guess my, my concern would be um, how do we, I mean, this is such a, such a tourist magnet. How do we uh, know that these won't be uh, sort of a food court, that what happened in Faneuil Hall and City Market won't happen here? Are you, are you open, have you thought about that? Are you open to some restrictions on the way that operates? Well, I believe the city uh, and the state are talking about some in-between quasi-management uh, group that we would cooperate with and basically negotiate with to fulfill what they'd like to happen in terms of governance here. Um, as much as uh, I love restaurants and retail and what have you, and that's been part of my past, uh, I, I think building the museum and operating the museum is challenging enough. So we, we very much want to explore with the push guide vendors, uh, management mechanisms that optimize what everyone wants here and not a food course. So. Anybody else? Yes, no? All right. One last shot at the advisory committee. <coughs> Sir? <coughs> My name is Mo Feingold. I'm an architect. And I've worked in the North End for almost 50 years. Uh, one of the things that uh, my wife and I have become accustomed to doing uh, since the Greenway is finished uh, is to walk the length and breadth of it uh, up and down and watch and watch it develop uh, uh, in its, its short life. Uh, I would find that the, the proposal for the museum would be a very energizing face uh, to that piece of the Greenway uh, and I would personally think that that would be a great asset rather than another uh, a private building that might be for commercial or residential uses. So I just want, like, I like the energy expressed in it and how it would reflect uh, to interacting with movement on the Greenway. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I also would hope that while the document refers to a, a minimum sustainability principles, that this would be an opportunity as the future of the representing the future of uh, Boston that we direct this to be much more of a, a net zero building and much more of a sustainable building in green principles uh, than is referred to in the document. Thank you. Easy to do. We got to, we got to go with the Children's Museum. Let's go further. Advisory committee, anybody else before we switch? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.